good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Adrian Morrison. I am an employee here at QCAM, a research scientist. And it is my great, great uh, privilege today to introduce Dr. Daniel Levine. Uh, Daniel uh, is a rather um, unique case in, in the theoretical chemistry community in that he has both experimental and theoretical chemistry experience, which is pretty impressive. Uh, he went to MIT for his undergraduate career, where he studied both chemistry and mathematics. There he worked on, he did some research working on molybdenum-based catalysts. He did his PhD with Don Tilly and Dick Anderson at UC Berkeley, where he continued to do work with catalysts, uh, this time transition metals and F-block elements. He stayed on at Berkeley to do his postdoc, but switched gears to theoretical chemistry. Uh, there he worked with Dr. Martin Head Gordon, and develops novel methods for energy decomposition analysis and strongly correlated systems. We've got a really exciting webinar for you today. We've had a lot of interest in, in this and uh, in, in Daniel's work, so we're excited to, to hear about it. All right, without any further ado, I will turn this over to, to Daniel. Well, thanks for that uh, introduction, Adrian. Um, excited to tell you all about some of the new multi-reference methods that are going to be available in QChem 5.1. Um, let's, without further ado, dive into, uh, dive into the webinar. Oh, quick, please. Thank you. Um, so most of what I'm going to talk about in today's webinar is about multi-reference methods, and, and they're there to solve the strong correlation problem. So I guess a little bit of background is in order. So what is strong correlation? Pretty much everyone has their own definition for what it is, but let's start by saying that it's an electron correlation effect that arises from low-lying excited electronic states mixing into the ground state wave function. And what this means is that single reference methods like hartree fock most flavors of DFT, MP2 couple cluster, they break down uh, sometimes catastrophically as the mean field approximation isn't even qualitatively correct for what's going on in these systems. Um, the single particle picture breaks down. So if you're used to thinking about things in orbitals, which as a experimental chemist, that's all we think about. Um, so what these shows up as is non-integer orbital occupation numbers, um, which can be a bit confusing. And this problem is especially bad, strong correlation that is, uh, with first row transition metals, multi-metallic systems, bond breaking systems, excited states, um, there's a number of places where, where these show up. So pretty much all aspects of chemistry can get screwed up by not accounting correctly for, for strong correlation when it's present. So I mentioned bond breaking. So if you have catalysts to make pharmaceuticals or materials or fuels, you're going to need to worry about this, especially because um, a lot of those catalysts are metals. Uh, in inorganic chemistry, you have photoabsorbers or high temperature superconductors or things of this sort, which are also, obviously there's many metals involved and strong correlation effects are present. And even in biological chemistry, um, about half of proteins contain metal cofactors. And a lot of these are, are small clusters of, of metals. Actually, we're gonna talk about a few more of those later in this webinar. Um, so, well, we have the strong correlation problem. What what problem? Uh, what methods do we have in the literature in in the community for dealing with this thing? Well, the the simplest thing is is full configuration interaction or full CI. Basically, you consider all possible occupations um, for your orbitals and diagonalize this big Hamiltonian, and that's great. It's exact, but it is factorially scaling. So it's pretty much only amenable to for setting the, the very smallest systems. Then there's CAS SCF, uh, complete active space self-consistent field method. This is sort of the workhorse of the strong correlation thing out there. It's in a lot of different codes um, and now also QCAM. Basically the idea is to restrict the full CI problem to a smaller active space. And you say, well, only these orbitals are problematic. Most of this space actually can be, can be well approximated by a mean field approach. And so you do that. So this is obviously still rapidly exponential scaling because you are still solving the full CI problem, albeit in a smaller space. And 
typically on like a desktop computer or even a cluster, uh, a work, um, a, a local cluster, you're probably only going to do something like 16 electrons and 16 orbitals, maybe 18 and 18 if you're exceedingly patient and you have a nice cluster. Um, massively parallel in implementations of CASA CF have gotten to 20 electrons and 20 orbitals, um, but that was a paper in itself just to say, hey, look, we did this. So that's that's really not typical. And uh, one last topic that I'm going to be talking about, especially today, is adaptive sampling CI, which is a form of selected CI. So in full CI and CASA CF, you're solving a full CI problem. You don't really worry about which orbitals are which. You just say all of them <laughs> and make all possible determinants. Um, whereas in selected CI, you're only going to use the important ones to, to form your wave function, and that's going to make things better. So it's still exponentially scaling, but it has a much smaller prefactor. And you can get to very large active spaces, um, more than 40 electrons easily on a workstation in a matter of in a matter of minutes. So let's briefly talk about the complete active space self-consistent field method. So I mentioned you basically need to partition your orbital space into an inactive space, uh, which can be treated by mean field, an active space, um, which I mentioned is solved by full CI, and you have a virtual space with just vacant orbitals. Um, in CASA CF, once you have defined these spaces, the span of these spaces, you're done because you can rotate your orbitals within each space and the energy doesn't change. And uh, so the whole purpose is there's orbital optimization to find this best partitioning of the orbital space. Uh, so now let's talk about it in QCAM 5.1. So this is now applicable to active spaces of about 15 electrons and 15 orbitals. That was about all I had patience for before I gave up. If you're more patient, you might be able to do 1616. Um, there are nuclear gradients and therefore also numerical frequencies available. Um, they are open MP parallelized. There are natural orbitals. Um, you can generate natural orbitals from your CASA CF procedure and they can be visualized using any of QCAM's standard orbital printing methods, or you can use them for, for further post hartree fock um, methodologies, anything that you, you might want to, to do with that. So here's a example input, uh, or it's not an example input, an example of the job control. So you turn on all the CAS methods in QCAM with this CAS method rem. If you say to one, it's CAS CI, which is no orbital optimization. And if you set it to two, it's CAS OCF, which does have this orbital optimization. Uh, you can specify the number of roots you actually want to solve for. You have to specify the number of electrons in your active space and your number of orbitals in your active space. That's sort of self-explanatory. You have to specify the max m sub s projection of your desired state. So if zero is a singlet, one is a doublet, two is a triplet, so on. And this is that thing about saving natural orbitals. Um, you overwrite the SCF orbitals with the cast natural orbitals, and that's how it, it maintains uh, the ability of QCHEM to use those for, for further work. Um, and if you're doing CASA CF, you also can optionally specify a special number of optimization cycles for the CASA CF procedure, separate from the actual um, single reference SCF procedure. Here's an example input for a stretched N2. So we've got our molecule. So this is a single point, but you can also do opt or freak, or transition state searching uh, is also possible because it's also a nuclear gradient. Um, so right now we're doing CASA CF for a singlet with 10 electrons and 10 orbitals. We want only the bottom root. We're going to compute the natural orbitals and uh, this CAS solver we'll talk about a little bit, but we're doing full CI in the active space and uh, we'll take 50 CASA CF cycles. So, but now what I'm gonna spend most of today talking about is this adaptive sampling configuration interaction method or ASCII. Um, which was a method that was developed um, in the Head Gordon and Wheelie group about, uh, about I guess, oh, look at that, I guess two years ago now, um, principally by Norm Tubman. And uh, there have been a lot of further improvements that we've made, and there's some subsequent publications coming out uh, <laughs> very shortly or extremely shortly, um, depending on uh, when I get back to editing papers instead of moving to New York. Um, so the general idea behind the adaptive sampling method is that the Hilbert space that you want to explore when you consider a really large active space is really big, 
but it's also really sparse. Most of the determinants that you might consider are going to be extremely low weight. Um, and and principally, I don't want to say it can be ignored, but they're not they're not the important thing to focus on um, when you're building your wave function. So the idea is you want to construct your wave function using only the most important determinants. So how do you find those without actually solving the whole Hamiltonian, which would defeat the purpose? Is well, there's a consistency relationship among uh, among the coefficients of a wave function eigenstate, namely that you can get the coefficient of a given determinant based on how it connects to other determinants in your wave function. So then we can say, well, we can turn this on its head and we can say we can make an estimate for the importance of any given determinant based on how it connects to our trial wave function. So you can see you can iteratively then build this up into a wave function um, that incorporates more and more of the most important determinants until a desired accuracy is reached. At which point, everything that's left over, definitionally, oops, as I drop my mouse, um, has uh, there's a lot of them, and they all have very low weights. So they're sort of ideal for treating with perturbation theory. This is similar to previous ideas of selected CI, notably the SIPSI method that's been around for some time. And uh, one of the strengths of the ASCII method is that it has a very simple wave function on SOTS, which, which allows us to, to um, to do lots of secondary things like, well, as you'll see, we can start getting nuclear gradients. Um, so how does this actually work? So you have a starting trial wave function. You then search using that equation I described for new determinants. To Once you've picked your determinants, you diagonalize that new Hamiltonian to get uh, your new energies. And then at this point, you can say, I'm done or I'm not. And if you're done, you can go to that post-processing to do that perturbation theory correction, or you can go back and, and search more. Um, so here's a animation of that sort of search idea. So here's your trial wave function and it's got some determinant in it and it's some occupation of electrons and orbitals. Then you say, all right, I'm going to search from this determinant. So we're going to say, let's, let's make single and double excitations from this determinant. So here's a single, let's hold that one for now. You can make double excitations. As double, and basically you make all of them, and you get a set of these single and double excitations for every one of these uh, determinants in your search uh, core space. Uh, in principle, also your wave function space or and your search space can overlap a bit, but that's that's not a problem. Then in ASCII, basically we we sort the wave function by this coefficient, the CI coefficient. The idea being that if you're only connected to something way down here, you're probably yourself not going to be that important. And so we can save a lot of time by not searching off things really down here. So now that we have all of these coefficients, uh, all of these determinants, and all of these candidate determinants, we then pick a new set of determinants, the best ones by this ranking value that we use to form our new wave function. So in this case, it looks like a 12 determinants, so we're going to pick the best 12 determinants from amongst all of these. So let's look at some results, actually. So here's C2, 12 electrons and 28 orbitals. So that's, if you were doing CASA CF, I guess about 140 billion determinants. Um, here in dark blue is the ASCII energy, the variational part, and in orange is the ASCII plus PG2 energy. Um, so that's including that perturbation correction for the uh, the remainder part of the Hilbert space that we haven't explicitly included. And in green is the exact DMRG result. Um, and you can see that even though this this wave function, uh, this Hilbert space is in principle hundreds of billions, um, with only 10,000 determinants or, or 50,000, you're well less than um, millihartree accuracy uh, with the, or well, <laughs> excuse me, you're at millihartree accuracy error is less than a millihartree um, with the exact result um, using this thing. And this only takes a handful of seconds to run. Um, we can go to an even bigger system. So here's chromium dimer with 48 electrons and 42 orbitals. That's full CI and the SVP basis set. Um, and again, here's the ASCII wave function. Here's with PG2. And here in green is the DMRG results. So here this has, I guess, about 2.4 quadrillion. Um, 
determinants in its Hilbert space, but once you've got 50,000, you're, you're also, you're within kcals of the absolute energy um, in this basis set. So what we can see is you can actually start getting full CI energies for lots of things. So one thing we did is we got full CI for the G1 test set, which is things like ethylene and ethane and phosphine um, in double and triple zeta basis sets. And, uh, and, and really the, the striking thing is that the sparsity of the Hilbert space is really something that needs to be taken advantage of if you want to start going to these massive spaces. If you were to try to do CASA CF, what all this tells you is that most of the things that you might have been considering were not going to be very important. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you that, that ASCII is a, is a useful full CI solver. And well, we mentioned before, CASA CF is full CI in an active space. So instead of doing full CI in your active space of a CAS calculation, you could do ASCII in the active space of your CAS calculation. And this makes a method that I call ASCII SCF. You might call it ASCII CASA CF in the analogy to DMRG CASA CF or something along these lines. I, I like ASCII, CAS, uh, ASCII SCF because technically speaking, it's not actually CAS in the active space, it's ASCII in the active space. But um, this simple wave function onsets I talked about before allows us to do orbital optimization relatively straightforwardly from, um, from, from the, uh, uh, an ASCII solution. Um, so we can now do something like CASA CF, or at least CASA CF level accuracy, um, with about 50 electrons or, or even more in about 100 orbitals on a workstation or a cluster. Um, without needing any sort of massive parallel implementation. And this takes on the order of, of minutes to hours, depending on your system size. Uh, I've also extended our nuclear grading code that I wrote for CASA CF to also work for the ASCII SCF. So we can also do nuclear gradients as well. So here's a couple of examples of some systems that I've looked at so far with the ASCII SCF method. So you have, here's an iron center with all these polypyridal things around here. So these redox non-innocent ligands, you can do 38 electrons, which includes also the pi system and the, and the metal center in 50 orbitals. Here's the oxygen, oxygen evolving complex of photosystem two. It's one of those important biological uh, cofactors that I talked about. And here I, I did it with 44 electrons and 55 orbitals. So that includes the 3D and 4D orbitals and all these manganeses, which um, if you read some, some of the literature about um, CASA CF with transition metals, you usually need to include the 4D in addition to the 3D orbitals, the so-called double shell effect. Um, there are reasons for why this is, but the point is you get much better energies when you can also include the 4D orbitals, which is something that even for a small system, if you just wanted the 3D and 4D orbitals, a single metal center, that's, that's already 10 orbitals right there. Um, and like I said, most, most CASA CF codes don't give you a whole lot more than 16. Uh, so being able to go to these larger active spaces is, is really critical for understanding what's going on in these systems. Uh, here's another example. Here's iron porphyrin. So this is with a 44 electron and 44 orbital active space. You can see here's the ASCII energy and here's the ASCII plus PT2 energy. Again, the PT2 energy sort of cleans things up slightly. So even though we're going from, what is this? Looks like 100,000 to 500,000 determinants here. Uh, it's still, um, less than 10 millihertries of energy difference between them when you have an ASCII plus PT2. Um, so experimentally, this molecule has a triplet ground state. Um, but if you ask Hartree Fock, it says it has a quintet ground state. Even if you ask ASCII with 44 electrons and 44 orbitals, it'll also say that it has a quintet ground state. But if you actually do ASCII SCF and you optimize your orbitals um, with, with this active space, you actually do recover a triplet ground state for this molecule. And uh, other people besides us, Sandeep Sharma, Garnet Chan, have also found that you, you really need large active spaces in order to correctly obtain the spin state ordering in this, this complex. Um, here's some geometry uh, uh, coordinates. So you have a C2 carbon dimer dissociation. Uh, you can see it's pretty smooth. There's, a, there's actually a surface crossing right here. Um, so that's the part that looks a little kinky there. And uh, you can also do excited states with this method. So I did just the singlet triplet gap um, in C2 and you can see you get very accurate uh, results, certainly comparable to, to other multi-reference methods you might be, might possibly be considering. And 
here's one thing that I found uh, particularly interesting that um, that we've just recently been able to do. So I mentioned that you can do geometry optimization. So this is ferrodoxin. It's one of these um, electron shuttling cofactors in biological molecules. Here's a, a model complex of it. So uh, experimentally, the crystal structure of, of these things is it has all the iron sulfur distances roughly equivalent or nearly so at about 2.3 angstroms, which, which makes sense. You, you would expect if you look at this, it would have a, a sort of pseudo tetrahedral, if you ignore the methyl groups, a sort of pseudo tetrahedral uh, structure. But the DFT structure, which is this one, which is the one that was used for a DMRG study on this molecule a couple of years ago, you get a mix of sort of 2.3 angstrom and 2.2 angstrom bond lengths, which might not sound like a big difference, but it's it's definitely statistically significant, and it results in this very distorted looking uh, distorted looking structure here. Um, so, but if we take ASCII SCF with 66 electrons and 64 orbitals, which is to say all of the iron 3D and 4D orbitals along with their electrons, and all of the sulfur 3P electrons and orbitals, uh, we recover that pseudo tetrahedral structure. The FES bonds all lengthen to an equivalent 2.3 angstroms, and also the ASCII SCF energy drops about 50 kcals during this optimization. Um, so I also made a video of it because I learned how to make videos in IQMOL, so I figured that would be fun. So you can see you go from here, everything sort of straightens out, and uh, you end up with more what you might expect this cluster to be. And it turns out this molecule is fairly strongly correlated. There's a couple of orbitals that have orbital occupation numbers of like 1.7 and 1.8 and 0.3 and 0.2 electrons. So when you're very far from zero, one, and two electrons, there's, there's good reason to think that whatever DFT is because DFT can't formally handle that, um, or Concham DFT can't formally handle that. Um, there's good reason to think that the DFT electronic structure is not going to be accurate. So we think that this, this structure is actually right for the right reasons. Um, let's talk a little bit about how to actually run um, ASCII SCF or ASCII in QCAM 5.1. So I mentioned that cast solver REM before that's one does CAS in the active space and two does ASCII in the active space. Um, you can specify a diagonalization algorithm so for the Hamiltonian so one is Davidson, two is um, a in course sparse matrix solve. Uh, that is much 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 faster than running Davidson and so that's definitely to be preferred and also the default. Uh, ASCII n-dets is the total number of determinants to include in the wave function. That's the uh, most important user user specified REM. There's uh, the size of the core space, which is how many determinants you're searching from during those search iterations. Uh, you don't actually have to set this, but you can. There's a default value in there. Um, there's the end. Uh, there's one other thing that you can do that you can use the natural orbitals while you're building up your ASCII wave function, which improves the compactness and the convergence of, of the ASCII wave function. Um, Sorry, not clicking correctly. Hold on. There it goes. Um, which improves the convergence of the ASCII wave function and, uh, and and is useful for getting better results. So here's an example input with, with uh, ASCII, SCF. Yes, SCF. So this is full CI chromium dimer. So you've got chromium. You've got some general QCAM things. Again, it can also be opt or freak. Um, CAS method two, so you're running CAS SCF on a singlet, 48 electrons, 42 orbitals. You only want one root. Here, I didn't care about the natural orbitals, though I could have if I wanted. Uh, the cast solver is two, it's ASCII. We are running with 100,000 determinants. We're gonna use these natural orbitals to improve the convergence, and uh, we are using the sparse matrix eigen solver. So in conclusion, I sort of went quickly through that, so hopefully we'll have time for some questions. Um, QCAM, 5.1, the version about to come out, and especially in 5.1.1, there's a couple of uh, improvements that we've made that we're ready to, to put into the code, but uh, QCAM 5.1 was already frozen. Um, we have a host of new multi-reference methods available for CASCI, CASSCF, ASCII, ASCII-SCF. Um, we can also now do um, arbitrary order truncated CI, so if you want to run CISDTQ567, um, I don't know why necessarily you would, but you can now run those. 
Um, you can now treat strongly correlated systems um, of 50 or even more electrons um, uh, using ASCII or ASCII SCF in minutes to hours on workstation or cluster level uh, hardware without needing any sort of massive parallelization algorithms. Um, there's orbital optimization and nuclear gradients uh, that are available for both QCAMS CAS SCF and ASCII SCF codes, which really I think will start opening a whole new host of problems um, to being studied. Uh, one thing that I think might be particularly interesting is there's, a, especially in the chemistry of the oxygen evolving complex, uh, it's unknown exactly uh, all, all of the effects of subtle nuclear um, perturbations on the energy. So now we can start probing that with different spin states and different electron occupation numbers, um, which is to say different charges of the complex. Um, we can start probing that using uh, using QCAM, and I'm fairly certain no other code can run some sort of uh, equivalent um, system, um, at least not straightforwardly, or as straightforwardly. Uh, Medium-sized, and, and particularly for me, this last point is particularly important because as Adrian mentioned, my background is in, in inorganic chemistry. So these medium-sized multimetallic systems that were really hampered by a, an inability to treat the strong correlation problem are now amenable to study, can be studied using QCAM, and I should, guess I shouldn't say no other software, but very few other softwares can, can handle this sort of, uh, this sort of systems. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank um, Professor Martin Hood Gordon, who uh, allowed a poor synthetic chemist to come into his group as a postdoc and get my hands dirty or feet wet or something in, in theoretical chemistry, and for allowing me to sort of go off the rails of what he wanted me to work on, to work on this project. Um, some collaborators of mine, uh, when we were developing this code, Dr. Alec White, who was at UC Berkeley in the Head Gordon group and is now in Garnet Chan's group at Caltech, um, did a lot of, uh, gave, was a big help in making the CAS and CAS CF implementation. ASCII development and implementation, especially Dr. Norm Tubman, who's uh, in the Whaler group at UC Berkeley, has been invaluable, not only for all of the ASCII development, um, but also for, for helping me uh, with the QCAM implementation. Diptarka Height, a grad student in the Hyde Gordon group, uh, and Dr. Susi Latala, who was a postdoc in the Berkeley group, Martin Hyde Gordon, and is now at University of Helsinki, has also done some testing and uh, some made some contributions to the development of the code. At QCAM, I want to thank Evgeny, who helped me integrate um, integrate all of the sort of new um, libqn's integral library into this method so it could be fast and he also helped me with parallelizing the orbital uh, excuse me the nuclear gradient um, and uh, Adrian Morrison for organizing the seminar and especially uh, when I he emailed me and said, can you send me some information about your, your webinar? And I said, no, I'm moving. Can you do it yourself? And he said, okay. So I, I really appreciate him uh, uh, taking that on um, uh, uh, while, I was, while I was in transition. Um, that was sort of a whirlwind tour of, of some of the capabilities in the code. I wanted to leave ample time for questions and I think I've left ample, ample time for questions. Um, so with that, I will, I will uh, I'll take it from here, Daniel. Okay. Uh, but thank you for that really, really interesting talk. That is impressive work, uh, a really compelling method. I think this is very cool stuff. Uh, we, we do have a few questions from the audience. Um, ah, a question about, yes, uh, excited states with ASCII, and is this completely general, or are there limitations in the states that can be treated? Yeah, so the, um, let's talk a little bit about that. So the way that the excited states are currently done uh, in, well, in ASCII or in CASCF, the implementation we have is, well, let's talk about ASCII for a second. Um, so when you do that search process, you search over determinants, fine. Um, then you have a set of determinants. You wanna make sure that your ground state and your excited states are treated at similar, similar levels of theory to make sure 
that you have a sort of a balanced treatment and you don't sort of bias the system toward one or the other. So what we actually do is um, we, so you have a, a ground state and you search over that for determinants and then you have each of the excited states that you're interested in, you also search over them and then you get one large diagonalization that includes the determinants that you want for your ground state and the term determinants that you want for your excited state. Um, and then you do one diagonalization together and you get the bottom n roots of your of your diagonalization. So you can only really do excited states, well, you can do the bottom n roots of your excited states. So if you want the bottom 10 roots, you can ask for the bottom 10 roots, um, but you can't ask for say the hundredth root and the first root, you'd have to compute all of the the intermediate states as well. Um, but there's no uh, limitation on like you can have the same spin state or different spin states. Um, uh, the the M sub S value is in a hard boundary. So if you want to include both singlets and triplets, you can spread it, specify the M sub S value as zero because there is an M sub S zero projection of a triplet. So that'll also show up if you specify M sub S, cast M sub S zero. Okay. I have uh, thank, yes, but, uh, thank you. Um, question about multi-reference PD2 on top of ASCII. Mm -hmm. um, are these ASCII wave functions obtained in a state average fashion? Ah, um, so so the for the ASCII wave function right now, the so the multi-reference PT2. Um, is is a state specific PG2. So each state is corrected by PG2 if you're doing multiple states. Um, right now we don't do state averaging for the ASCII SCF optimization. Um, part of this is a bit of a bias by by certain people in the QCAM uh, organization who are leery of state averaging because it, well. The, there's an open question. What is the right, if you're state averaging, should it be 50% ground state, 50% excited state, or what, what should the correct ratio be? And that's a bit unclear, although that is usually what people do is sort of equal weights for all states. But yeah, right now ASCII and CASA CF in QCAM is not state averaged. Um, and everyone, every, every, every state is its own, its own state. Okay. Uh are there spin orbit couplings available or are other properties available? Ah, so um, right now you can spit out, <clears throat> excuse me, one and two PDMs um, for ASCII or CAS wave functions. And in principle, if you have a property that you can trace with your one and two particle density matrix, then you're in business. Um, spin orbit coupling is not currently uh, available because well, not currently available in QCAM um, for reasons. Um, however, you can output the results to uh, a FCI dump file and use spin orbit coupling in some other code, or more likely if you want to do something like a DKH Hamiltonian type thing, which is not, not spin orbit, but uh, uh, relativistic effect correction that is not currently available in QCAM. You can read in integrals from other codes um, and use them to run ASCII uh, in QCAM. Um, but right now, spin orbit coupling is not done directly in QCAM. That is on the many, many item list to uh, to get to for this method. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, is is uh, there multi-node parallelism available? Um, not. Currently, everything is shared memory, shared memory parallel, OpenMP parallelized, um, which principally means the integrals at this point. Um, there is some parallelization for um, the other algorithms that are not nearly as um, efficient as QCAM's integral parallelization. So the speed up you see is mostly due to integrals and less due to um, the other parts of the code, although that is also on the long list of things <laughs> um, to be improved uh, in the coming releases. There's always a long list of things to improve. Yes. Uh, I have a practical question. That, um, I think in, in uh, using the ASCII code, uh, there maybe were instances where the CAS and CF did not converge. I wonder, is it possible to change the convergence algorithm? And do you have any comments on that? Uh, the convergence algorithm for CAS-SCF for the orbital optimization yeah. procedure. Yeah. So right now, um, 
the only um, excuse me, the only optimization procedures for the CASA CF slash ASCII SCF optimization are um, quasi Newton methods. So there's BFGS, um, there's GDM, which is a QCAM's preconditioned BFGS, and there's a another version of of um, of, of this preconditioned BFGS that uses a, a um, excuse me, a quadratic line search step, which guarantees that the energy always goes down at every optimization step. And when it can't go down, it knows it before it tries. Excuse me. So uh, it will try to make the energy go down as much as it can. And then when it decides it can't make it go down any further, it'll say, I'm sorry, I can't make this go down any further and terminate. Um, Though, well, which sounds great, but uh, as always, there's no free lunch. That that algorithm takes about twice as long to run an equivalent number of optimization steps as a normal preconditioned BFGS. But if you really want the energy to go down at every step, the energy will go down at every step. Okay, and is there a specific keyword for that for job control? Mm, actually, I don't think there is. Um, <laughs> I should definitely add that to my point one. Point one. <laughs> um, right now, I think it'll use what? Uh, no, yeah, I'll have to add it for QCM five point one point one. Sorry about that. Yep, no, no problem. Um, in terms of the gradient performance, can we expect to uh, optimize? systems, the same size of systems that we can do a single points on? Yeah, so let's, if we jump back for a second to uh, Ferrodoxin. So um, every one of the steps in the Ferrodoxin from from here to, to the end, um, each one of those, the single point takes about four hours to run and the, uh, on 16 cores, mostly integrals, um, and the, oops, I'm showing you the secret sauce. Um, and the nuclear grain takes about four hours to run also. So it's about eight hours per optimization step uh, with about half that time in the nuclear gradient and half that time in the actual single point. Um, so this this was something like, I don't remember, 20 something steps. So that took whatever 20 times eight hours was um which which is fine for a reasonable size system so yeah if you can if you can handle single points for this guy and waiting four hours then you can handle getting nuclear gradients and waiting also like four hours okay that, that sounds great um uh, so I ask you that the uh exp or, um, exponential scaling with active space uh how's it scale with basis set uh yeah so the the most important important, uh, well, okay, that, there's a couple of things involved in here. So, um, so you need to form your integrals. So if you're saying you're, you have the same number of active orbitals, but you increase the number of virtuals by a lot, then sure, that's going to increase the, uh, the time to actually compute the integrals with the rest of the space. Um, I guess it would have the normal integral build time scaling for uh, increasing with the number of basis set size. Um, so if you keep your active space constant, it's strictly polynomial, I guess, with um, with with the other integral with the with basis set size. Excuse me. Okay, so it depends on the integral. So uh, I missed that. Oh, so yeah, the, the, the just depends on the integral scaling. Yeah, exactly. I guess I I'm sort of curious. Uh, you, you touched on this briefly with the potential, one of the potential energy services you uh, showed. Um, I'm just thinking about how the, uh, how robust the, the search algorithm is with respect to changes in nuclear coordinates. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it was a bit of a, I want to say a surprise, but it's, it's definitely not clear that as you sort of stretch things, everything will stay okay. And right. pretty much the answer is it, it will stay okay as long as you converge the energy at each point. 
because you're always converging to with the ASCII part, the variational part, you're always converging to the full CI result. So as long as your energy is converged, you won't have any problems. If your energy is sort of barely converged at one part of the potential energy surface and it might fall out of it at another part, then you might start to see some problems. Um, but, but principally what we're seeing is that especially, well, one of the things that we thought uh, is, is a bit surprising and, and rather nice is that if you have the PG2 including thing, it makes it surprisingly insensitive um, to, to the number of determinants in your space. So you can see the variational space going from probably 10,000 to um, 100,000? No, 10,000 to 50,000. Um, you can see that the ASCII variational energy drops a lot, but the PT2 including energy does not drop as much. Similarly, over here, you see that the PT2 sort of smooths a lot of things out. Um, so if you have your PT2 including thing in there, the even changing by thousands of determinants doesn't really make things that bad. Again, that's also probably related to the fact that once you converge the result, then everything looks nice. The, the tricky part with, with ASCII is just making sure that you've converged your results sufficiently when you start exploring your potential energy surface. Um, but even then for like subtle, for like in the paradoxic case, even subtle um, geometric perturbations, as long as your underlying, your underlying wave function is at least qualitatively correct, even if it's not completely converged, you'll probably get decent looking results. Um, sort of like when you run a geometry optimization with like a smaller basis set um then uh and then run a single point at a higher level of theory as generally speaking you can sort of get away with a little bit of just being qualitatively if not quantitatively exactly converged when doing a geometry optimization of course if you're very far from things then you might have to start worrying about things and and it does recompute um search steps during that um movement through the potential energy surface so it will hopefully the idea is and we haven't seen any cases where it doesn't yet though i'm not going to say that they don't exist um in fact it'd be sort of surprising if they don't exist uh cases where um there might be a breakdown um but for for now it seems like um the number of determinants that fall in and out of importance is is not that rapid yeah that sounds like as long as it's converged you're, you're okay converged to high enough accuracy yeah so this is another thing some people don't like about this method is is formally it, it's not size extensive either except if your energy is converged <laughs> um if your energy is converged then the size extensivity error has to be smaller than your convergence error so if your error is converged to a kcal the only possible size extensivity error you can also have is less than a kcal i see yeah, very, very interesting. Yep. Uh, got a couple more quick questions from the audience here. Okay. Um, there specific uh, job control keyword for PT2 correction? Yeah, so there's, um, <laughs> right now the only option is yes and no. So there's, uh, the default is to always do the PT2 correction because it does improve the energy substantially. Although it can take a bit longer to run, well, it does often take a bit longer to run than the ASCII procedure itself. Um, depending on a lot of parameters that you tune. Um, but so right now there's a ASCII underscore skip underscore PT2, um, which allows you to skip the PT2. Um, but otherwise the default is to always do the PT2. Okay, good. No. Um, is it possible to target symmetry specific states? Um, right now there is not a way to do this. It is also in the list though it's slightly further down on the list. Um, right now, the, the top thing on the list is to, basically, uh, the short answer is I didn't understand how QCAM symmetry code worked. Um, and so I wasn't able to do it, though that's something that uh, hopefully a grad student or postdoc or QCAM employee uh, in the future could uh, probably easily incorporate um, QCAM symmetry code into, into this method. Um, right now, I. Yeah, right now I don't really know how it works. Sorry. That is fair. Uh, maybe one more here. Do you have any advice for somebody with uh, difficulty converging ASCII 
for a PDI Iron One system? Um, specific. So one thing that I found actually to be very effective is um, so when you initially run a set up an ASCII calculation, um, it it's using canonical Hartree-Fock orbitals to define the span of the inactive, active, and virtual space. So if you want to get the correct space, um, the correct possible spaces, uh, it's useful if you start with a relatively small number of determinants, um, say like 10,000 or 50,000 determinants, which will run, both A, will both run very fast, and B, will be at least qualitatively correct enough that there won't be so many um, sort of local minima or, or sort of uh, the, the little nooks and crannies that always uh, plague MCSCF optimizations. So for example, with the Porphyrin system, I found that the best way to get good convergence was to sort of bootstrap one onto the other. So if you, you start with a calculation with 50,000 determinants, that usually converges better than a calculation with 200,000 determinants, and then use the orbitals from the 50,000 determinant optimization as the initial guess for the 200,000 optimization, and so on. Um, and, and that, I found, was very useful for getting around some of these, uh, some of these, some of these tricky bits. Uh, you can also do um, a spin flip thing, so you can specify um, you can specify the point of the M sub S thing is you can specify one spin state up here and a different spin state down here. So you could do like a spin flip type thing where you, if you there's a, a more sensible RHF reference um, with a higher spin configuration, then you can spin flip down here to get to the spin state you want. Um, so that's another option you can also try. Great, thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Um, maybe we just one. more more discoveries about tricks to optimize will come from further experimentation with the method. For sure, yes. Yeah, let's do. Um, maybe as a uh, catalytic chemist yourself, um, could you comment on how ASCII might be applied in uh, catalysis research? Sure. So. Like I said, it's, it's still currently unknown exactly how, for example, the oxygen evolution catalyst uh, complex actually does its chemistry. And it's still unknown, um, particularly how FUMOCO, the, the nitrogenase enzyme cofactor, actually does its chemistry. And if you want to make sort of structural mimics or, or well, not structural mimics, if you want to make functional mimics, for these sorts of things synthetically, it's really useful to know exactly what is going on in the first place. So, for example, there's a there's a big open question in the water oxidation um, community about whether and what exactly is the oxidation state of manganese or cobalt that's actually involved in doing the real chemistry. Is it two manganese fours um, with bridging oxos? Is it a manganese five with a terminal oxo? There's lots of reasons to think that that might be interesting and and determining what you want to target. If you're trying to make one of these or the other one, you need to know which is the one that's actually going to do the chemistry you want. So by being able to study something like the OEC with a proper multi-reference treatment for all those different metal centers that properly in, uh, takes into account the, the strongly correlated nature of the complex, we'll be able to actually figure out, hopefully, um, what actually is the mechanism of the OEC complex. And that'll tell us, should you be targeting bimetallic manganese things or is a single metallic or a single center manganese that can occupy a manganese five state more important something along these lines um and and that's sort of unknown right now uh although there's some evidence that says maybe more metals is better <laughs> um but it's not 100 percent clear what what is the best target to work on thank you that's that's really enlightening um, I think that's all for the questions. Oh, okay, one more quick one. Is it possible to do a restart or, or a guess? Yeah, so there is a um, ASCII underscore restart scheme. So uh, at all points during the algorithm, it will save its current determinant list and the wave function coefficients associated with them into a file in the QChem scratch folder. And so if you if a job dies, you can restart um, by reading from that uh, uh, determinant list, and it'll read that back into QChem. Um, 
to uh, as an initial guess for continuing an ASCII calculation. Great, thank you. Um, all right, but I think that's all the time we have for questions, and that's all the questions we have as well. Uh, thank you again, Daniel, for that really impressive talk. Uh, it's a really cool method that you put together. Uh, I'd also like to thank the, the attendees for uh, their time today and for coming to this meeting. Uh, if you came late or you'd like to see this webinar again, you can find it on YouTube. Oh, here's the link here. Um, feel free to get in touch with myself or any of the QCAM support staff if you want to follow up about this or other QCAM topics. Um, you can find the, these webinars and as well as, as, well as upcoming webinars uh, on our website here. Um, here they all are, and those will link to the YouTube videos. I also encourage uh, new QCAM users to check out instructional materials on the website. Um, there are tutorials and basic lesson plans on this site. Uh, and they're all quite useful. I thank Daniel again and all the attendees again for their time. And I think that will conclude our webinar. This concludes our webinar. We would like to thank Dr. Daniel Levine for his excellent presentation, as well as Dr. Adrian Morrison for organizing, running, and moderating this webinar. We also invite you to visit us on Facebook. Thank you for your participation and see you at the next webinar.